Okay. Um, Aaron Roberts of Poor Lolo is with us today. There's a couple of things I want to start um, off with. Uh, so I've been scoring people's Pat Patterson exercises this morning. And what um, Chris and others have already noted to me is that there were two places in Canvas to upload uh, your lyrics. And um, so as I was grading one, I was entering zeros for things that weren't entered. And as I was grading the other, you might have placed it in one or the other. And so you might have, it might have shown up that you had a zero grade. I think I have fixed all of that by now. Um, and it's just that when I copy assignments sometimes in Canvas, it creates a new thing in my grade book instead of just copying and having it accessible for people. Um, so that won't happen much more in the future now that I know that Canvas does that. Um, but uh, if you're ever worried about your grade or anything, just always email me um, and, and say what's going on with my grade. Uh, but that should be all fixed. Um, if it hasn't already showed up for you, it should be fixed by um, the end of the day. Uh, a couple I can of... grade it on this, Roger? <laughs> what's <a> grade? <laughs> I don't want um, to. The other thing is that, so these are, the, the assignments are out of this book. They're not out of this book, which you should actually be reading this book. This, so this, this was in the reading assignments, but this is the book every day. There are writing assignments out of this book. They go every two weeks. Um, so it's just one exercise per day. And every two weeks I have you upload them. So when you upload them, it should be two weeks of writing that you've done every day. And a lot of people have been just taking pictures of their journals and their notebooks, and that's totally fine. I'm not reading them intensely or anything. There are some in modules this week. There are some suggestions that I have um, based on like David Bowie and cut up exercises and stuff like that of stuff to start doing with our texts. Um, uh, now that you've produced a bunch of lyrics um, themselves and you know, of course, whenever you're inspired and the lightning comes into your brain, you go with those lyrics. But the whole um, thing about lyric writing challenges is to write every day, um, whether or not um, uh, to create um, momentum, even when there's not magic. Uh, any questions on that stuff before we get going with Aaron? Yeah, go ahead, Ransom. Yeah, um, I just got my book in this past week. Uh, can I still uh, catch up and submit those past weeks to you? Yeah, yeah, always for me. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions before we get going? Okay. Um, so I uploaded, you know, last week I, I created an announcement with information about Erin and a um, website for her band. Um, she's also worked a lot in radio and um, she's doing a lot of work up in Fort Collins, um, uh, which uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about today too, because it, it becomes important for those of us, at least when we are physically able to do shows again, um, to figure out how to perform locally and not oversaturate a scene and play too often in Denver or something like that. So um, having like local connections up in Boulder or Fort, Fort Collins or um, down south, there's kind of a project at work in creating an I-25 corridor. Um, so we can talk about that and, and Aaron's music, but maybe I'll just let Aaron talk a minute about herself and what she does. And then you guys can think about questions that you have for her. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me, Roger. This is such a treat. I came to one of Roger's classes, man, it must have been 10 years ago, a really long time ago in person. Um, so this is new, the Zoom format. Um, so I have a band called Poor Lolo that, uh, that I've been doing since about 2002. And it's been so many iterations over the years it started as a project between that was just me and a guy i went to college with at university of illinois who i met up back met back up with in boulder colorado and um 
you know, I played a show recently and the guy, the MC was like, raise your hand if, if you and if anyone has been in the band Poor Lolo and there were probably like seven people that raised their hand. Roger, you would raise your hand. Um, so we have a rotating cast of musicians. Community is really, really important to me. And so um, I like to try a lot of different things out with the lineup. I like to invite, you know, guest guitarists or drummers. My last show at UMS, we had uh, maybe like six different drummers for the for the eight song set. So um, I, I wouldn't mind if the set sounded different every time we played, honestly. It's it's really fun and exciting to keep it keep the band really live. Um, let's see, this is going to be rambling. I'm not so well prepared. Um, I put out two full length albums and a bunch of EPs. Um, toured a fair amount. I don't know what else to say about Poor Lolo. I also, um, yeah, I have a background in radio, community and college radio. So I've done a lot with um, Colorado based music promotion. And um, after being in radio and really having a love for community building within uh, Colorado based bands, I started a project years ago called Audiovore, and that's a website that's dedicated to the documentation and promotion of Colorado-based bands. That went on hold for a little while um, when I had really young kids, and we brought that back last year with the intention of um, continuing to make video and audio for Colorado-based bands, but also we created this um, a residency program to train women and people of color in audio and video production. So we're training kind of mid-level um, mid career people. So maybe, maybe folks that have like gone to college for radio or sorry, audio or video production, but don't have a lot of experience doing um, live recording or um, editing live music. So um, that program, unfortunately, our first cohort that had received the residencies for that program, which is called Sound Insight. Um, we were just getting started with a live music series in March when everything, when the rug got pulled out from under the music industry. So we're kind of waiting to see what happens with that. Um, crazily, you know, the arts and the Department of Arts and Venues for the city of Denver gave us a grant that funded that program. And that arts and venues has just been gutted by um, budget cuts from the city. So we're kind of waiting to hear what's going to happen with that program. We've we've already been gifted the money for that residency, um, but we would love we we hope that arts and venues gets restocked once COVID simmers down and the um, the arts community can build back up a little more. Yeah, I see a comment from Jamilia that says, um, yes, the digital life is quite interesting these days. Did anyone have questions for Aaron, either about process and songwriting or about the projects that she has going on? Don't be shy. <laughs> I have a question, actually. I. Um... I'm working on doing a grant for my senior project that's from Arts and Venues. Uh -huh. And it's essentially to pay a venue slash studio. Hopefully if we have to do a studio, we can try and get that grant money to a venue that might be struggling. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, I was just gonna ask you how that process was about signing up for that grant. Yeah, I mean, I think that especially with arts and venues, their grant requirement, they're super clear about their grant requirements. They're right. very specific about what they're looking for. And I would encourage you to use as much of the language in their grant um, ask, it, like co copy and paste that into your grant proposal. So, you know, mi mimic the language, kind of bullet point every ask that they have every requirement that they have of their grant, I would kind of go line by line and say, this project fulfills your requirement because of this and really look, uh, speak clearly to the outcomes that they're looking for. Like why you think it's important, who it will benefit, kind of how many people it will benefit. 
um, that's my that's kind of how I approach I've done a lot of grant writing in the past and that's how I approach it I really kind of highlight and underline exactly what they're asking for in the grant and address very specific in very specific terms um, why the project will uh, will um, qualify for that grant awesome thank you was that what you were looking for yeah yeah absolutely Thank you. I guess I would ask you, Roger, um, because I don't know the kind of who's in your class. Like what, what are you focused on right now with songwriting? <laughs> Um, so we're about to enter into the workshop phase of the class. So the class began um, uh, with some covers like, like folk anthology song covers and then um, some assignments where I had people cover, like pick somebody that they felt was really influential to them, cover them and then put an original of theirs and compare their own aesthetic. So what makes you you in relation to somebody that you find influential or in, in relation to tradition. And then we've had some phrasing exercises where I gave people um, a pre-written poem and we all worked with the same lyrics, but we produced different material. So it's been about learning each other's aesthetics and, and learning some language around aesthetics, like um, uh, how, to, how to talk aesthetically, what are the complications of um, the politics of genre, for example, um, sometimes um, uh, racial politics around genres of music, and yet at the same time trying to articulate what our own aesthetic sensibilities are when we have to work with other people, whether it's engineers or sound people. Um, so that's been like the content of the writing content of the course. And then these face-to-face -face, um, kind of meetings uh, have been focused on people who are um, kind of in, in one way or another working with music as songwriters and working sort of publicly in community. Um, although we did start with Lisa G was the first week. Um, so a lot of what you've just said will be familiar to people. Um, and like, uh, so Jake Miller was in last week and he was talking about booking and the complications of booking. And um, uh, we watched some of the Dazzle videos this summer on um, some uh, on on this issue the issues of racism with like structural racism within the community not having enough booking agents of color so an underlying question here is like what you know in the changing nature of covid which everybody is commenting on it's changing the ways that we write it's changing all of our social interactions with people and is there potential in that moment to make uh things a little bit more equitable on the other end maybe of, of covid and it could be in terms of of ethnicity or gender or we've talked about abilities and disabilities a little bit in class as well in terms of grants like these grants everybody seems to have projects that they're doing in addition to being you know just a songwriter uh, uh, yeah any other anybody have questions for aaron That songwriting process. Sure, um, it really, it really, it varies depending on um, where I'm at at whatever time. But in general, I I, I write alone initially, and um, I'm very based in melody. So I'll get a guitar or a piano and. Um, just start kind of improvising on some chords and some chord structures and singing melodies over over those chord structures. I mean, I'm very, um, well, when I say pop, now we're gonna get into like the, the aesthetic conversation, not pop like Britney Spears pop, but like I love hooky, really hooky melodies. I want, I like to write songs that you remember 
or you remember melodically after the first time you hear them. So I always start with kind of melody and, and mumbling. <clears throat> I have, because my time has been so um, limited to work on songwriting in the last really seven years, really since I had kids, I've start I've been doing a lot of writing without an instrument, but I'll still write melodically. Like I, I write a lot when I'm driving or or walking in kind of these interstitial moments in life. But I still kind of think of a melody and um, like maybe just a snippet of words. And, and usually if I can think of like a short sentence or some, or if I hear something on the radio, a phrase that resonates with me, um, I'll get a feeling and kind of build a song out from there. I often finish the chord structure and like melodic composition of the song before I finish lyrics, like pretty much 99% of the time. I very, very rarely written a poem. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever written anything down and then turned that into a song afterwards because Kate, I mean, like cadence and which, which, like which vowels ring on which parts of the song, like that to me defines a song that's just the way I write. Like I, I have to go from melody and tone to lyrics. Um, but yeah, I think I write more and more without an instrument and then bring it back and figure out like which chords work with this melody that I've invented in my head. Um, like right before bed is when I do a lot of writing, I'll be laying like almost going to sleep and then I'll come up with some lyrical melodies and get out my voice memo and, and get them down but I probably have like 400 voice memos that I dig back through when I'm sitting down then with the instrument to try to piece together. Um, and I definitely piece a lot of things together. Like I'll get 20 song ideas going in a week and then maybe one or two songs will come out of that. But I do try to write a little bit every day or do a little bit of ideating every day and, and not just working on or replaying old songs. I try to ideate something new pretty continuously as practice. Do you feel like you have a hard time uh, uh, moving away from like similar sounding songs or like a similar like feel to songs? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I, I feel like they're, like certain times in my life are really, yeah, they'll, they'll be like albums where it's like, I put an A minor in every single song and then the next ones are like all very major chord. So it's almost this cyclical thing where I'll get into um, like a, a like literal rhythm and I can't get my mind unstuck from that like chordal rhythm. Um, but yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is, a it's very challenging. Or like I'll, yeah. st I'll get stuck in a strum pattern or something like that. Yeah, totally. It's like it's like you just start jamming out and then you're like, wait, I feel like I'm always doing this similar like <laughs> similar yeah. strum or progression. And so yeah, I'm just trying to branch out too. So I think one thing if I really get stuck, I'll just pick up an instrument I don't know how to play very well, like the the piano I'm not great yeah. at. And I'll try to write on something where I can't get stuck in a strumming pattern or I can't get stuck in any deep seated habits. Oh, or, that's smart. Yeah. Or that's when I'll like walk and try to um, think of a melody in or sing something in my head because that's not um, just kind of the rhythm of walking uh, like levels the playing field. And then I have to bring that back and adapt whatever instrument it is to that. Um, sometimes it doesn't work at all and it's, Super stupid idea. And That's I a great say, idea. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, yeah, no, I was just going to say, I'm just very used to producing like tons and tons of just total shit. Just like songs that I'm like, I go back and listen to on my voice memos and that is horrible. That is horrible. So I, I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you guys, but like, have you ever been streaming something on your phone or like in the car and then one of your really terrible voice memos comes up <laughs> <laughs> that's happened to me i've accidentally like downloaded them into itunes and then just really bad really embarrassing that happens to me all the time literally yeah. all the time and it's very disappointing <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, or songs you're singing and you're like, wow, it wasn't as good as the actual song I was hearing a second ago. No. Um, there's a question here in the chats from Christopher. It says, um, what is it like working with so many musicians? Do you just give them sheet music at the show or is there a lot of practice? Like are people just playing at the show or are they quote joining the band for a while? That's a good question. Um, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of both. So um, I actually have a band that I've been playing with pretty regularly now. Um, gosh, I, I would say for the last uh, maybe like five years and it's a pretty consistent lineup. Um, that being said, the, the people that I play with regularly, um, well, Jake Miller is one who was your guest last week. He plays guitar with us now. Um, there are, the people that I play with are all in all kinds of other bands. And like my bass player, Anna, she, she plays in her, she fronts her own band and then also is a guitar tech who tours around with musicians and tunes and fixes on guitars. So the, there are a lot of times when show opportunities will come up that I wanna take, that are important enough to take, that I know my band isn't available for. And so in that case, I will come up with a different kind of idea or lineup. Like there is a guy um, here in Fort Collins who plays pedal steel and he runs it through a lot of effects. And I know that I can, and he's an, an amazing musician. So um, I've often played with him and I can just get together with him maybe once or twice before the live show. He can, he listens to the music in advance, plays a couple times, but he's just at the point in his professional career where he can hear something. And my songs are, aren't super complicated. They're pretty simple chord structure. So he can run with it live. And um, I would say he is like an auxiliary Poor Lolo member. Like, I don't think he would consider himself part of the band, but I would say that he feels very connected to the band because he's played enough times. Um, so like once I've worked, his name's Jesse Bates, he's amazing. Um, so Jesse has actually played with us. I've played with him as a duo many times. There have been times where Anna, our bass player, or Jake Miller is on tour with someone else. As, as Jake plays with Esme as well. And, um, and then I'll have him either fill in on bass or on pedal steel. So the sound, it's really cool because the sound of Poor Lolo then changes. Like we will have a show where, Jake, I mean, Jake's style and Jesse Bates on pedal steel it transforms the songs and they go in very different places. Structurally, they're the same. They start and finish at the same time. The parts all start and finish at the same time, but kind of the sonic feel of the songs is quite different. And I think that's really nice for the audience sometimes too. They, they don't quite know what they're gonna get when they come to a Poor Lolo show. They have an idea at this point that the, that the um, lineup could be a little bit different. Um, as far as do I give them a sheet, we definitely always practice in advance. I don't think I'd feel comfortable having someone just show up unless I'd known. Yeah. Um, and then I, I don't really give them sheet music. I, in advance, um, I'll give them, you know, just like, here's the song, here's what key it's in. And here are the, here are the main changes. The, these are the chords in the chorus. These are the chords in the, uh, uh, verse, you know, that kind of thing. But we don't, our band doesn't practice a lot unless we're, we're um, getting a new song. We're working through a new song. And a lot of times we work through a new song in advance of the recording studio. And then it changes a lot once we're in the recording studio. And then really whatever we record kind of becomes the structure and the form moving forward. So all those things go together, really practice studio like that. How many of you have um, worked in recordings, have worked in, with the recording process before, like in a studio or at home? Is there like, is there like a- hand? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say not you? <laughs> yeah, I said not me. <laughs> it varies, it's about half and half. Um, so a lot of the students in the class, Aaron, are, are um, 
former DIME students. This is Detroit Institute of Music Education. And so a lot of the students are actually in Detroit right now. Um, oh, how fun. And, and Metro had uh, a relationship with them then had a building in Denver, but that relationship ended last March. And so lots of students are, are still finishing their undergraduate degrees through Metro, uh, even though um, DIME isn't 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 a thing. Um, and so, and the people who are in DIME, I mean, some of you, you all are like seniors or, or, or fourth years, you've taken multiple songwriting classes, they've been in studios, um, released um, stuff on um, uh, albums on um, Spotify, on Bandcamp, on... Oh, amazing. I would love to... Roger, <clears throat> you could link me to some of those yeah. after this. I'd love to hear. Yeah, someone's at my door, but you guys keep talking. <laughs> Okay. Now, like just speaking to the recording process, I think that the the most influential thing in the life cycle of my band has been like finding a producer and recording artist, or sorry, a um, a recording studio that could really translate the um, like what I was bringing in to the right aesthetic. So I've been working with this guy James Barone, and he. Um, he recorded the latest uh, Nathaniel Rateliff solo album and some other things and had some training with this guy Richard Swift out on the uh, West Coast. So he does a lot like very analog, runs a lot through tape and, ha and like, really can nail this like vintage, like vintage 70s sound, 70s tone that that I was having a hard time getting engineers to translate sonically before working with him. And it was like a very seamless process when I started working with him. He kind of understood um, what tone I was going for and and then really pushed our band sonically um, to a place that it was like, when I finally heard the recordings, I was like, this is finally, I finally feel like poor Lolo is being played back to me like I've always heard it in my head. Um, so that was, for me, I wished I would have exper I was kind of tied to one engineer and studio early on, partially because I worked there. I worked at a place in Denver, great place, but it wasn't, I wasn't getting sonically what I really wanted out of those sessions. And um, I wished that I'd experimented a little more early on with some, some different producers. And I'd never really had a like I, I'd never really worked with a producer early on. So it was kind of like when the engineers were asking like, well, what, you know, what, what sound do you want? What tone? I, I didn't even know what to say, which is cool that you're having these conversations here. Cause I was, I had such a hard time referencing what sounds and tones I wanted to come out. And so, um, yeah, it was nice to finally have a producer that I that could help translate that sonically. Yeah, I feel like that's especially important, like with sensibilities like yours, Erin, where it's like, you know, you use the term vintage um, or or like lo-fi types of sounds, and this is all stuff that it's fairly easy to sort of make in the studio or you can have vintage amps and plugins and all of this sort of stuff but it's not really like like it's kind of like you have to have the sensibility or the producer or the engineer has to have the sensibility to really understand um and and a lot of times you're in this kind of push and pull especially with somebody who's very thinks of themselves as a, a and it's not just in the studio but in the live performance space where where you know if like the so like i have this where like i like my music is kind of psychedelic sometimes there's like really spacey it has all this stuff going on and and like you know if i'm asking for reverb on my voice like i want reverb on my voice if i like i don't care if my voice comes out clearly but if the sound engineers like got some pride and they're like oh i want to make i want to dial this in so everybody can hear rogers what rogers saying for every word it's like well then we're in an aesthetic debate <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, I really, yeah, that idea of finding other people who are sensible to what you're doing, I think is super important. Yeah. And, and, and bandmates too, 
Yeah. Um, actually having worked with so many different musicians, like, I guess I didn't answer Christopher's question in that. Like, sometimes it sucks working with so many different musicians. Sometimes I get a group together for a show and it's like so sonically not good, but that's what it's going to be for that show. Or not even not good, but not true to poor Lolo. And those are some, those have been some tough or uncomfortable shows. Hmm. Yeah, Sonic, the Sonic stuff is, takes a long time to figure out. And the personality stuff too, and the ego stuff. Yeah, Roger, when I first started Poor Lolo, or back in some of the early days, Roger and I did a lot of duo shows and they, we did some weird, they were not always linear shows, you know, they went places. <laughs> was fun. Uh, speaking on, on, um, you know, like dealing with like different people, um, throughout, uh, mm -hmm. your, your time with Pro Lolo, um, have you ever uh, had issues when it comes to, um, you know, like, like paying band members like over time? Um, for like the the uh, stuff that they record with you, has that ever become like an issue as far as like trying to li lineate where that goes? You know, it hasn't really been that much of an issue because we don't really we don't make a lot of income, and I think um, like everyone that plays with me, I I pay I pay our musicians to for their live live stuff. Um, but I don't usually pay them to record or actually that's not true. I usually pay them to record, but they don't get like a cut of the, um, like the income from record sales. It hasn't been an issue, but I think part of that is, um, you know, like we're a tight community. The, the musicians that I draw, f that I pull from. The, the musicians that I play with, I pull from a really awesome tight community of people that we, we've, we've known each other for a while. We've all played in interchanging bands. We kind of understand very much the, um, the economics of the music industry, the type of money we're making for shows. Like we're very aware what each other, like the income and what comes in and what comes out, how much it costs to, to like reserve the rental space, what we're probably making each show, what it costs to, to go into the studio. So I th think there's not a huge struggle over money, partially because everyone's coming from a place of scarcity. And so it's not like any one person is overwhelmingly making more than another in this process. Okay, thank you. Is that something that you've struggled with before? Um, not much. Um, I, I haven't really recorded anything and, and distributed it yet, but I was just thinking about that as far as like going ahead with um, trying to distribute music and working with different people. Um, if that was like ever an issue that you encountered. Yeah, it hasn't been, but I know, but I see it being an issue for for different people. And I think it becomes more of an issue when like more money is made. So um, yeah, I think there are probably other business professionals that can speak more to that as far as like points and, and you know, all the shares that come from, um, from record sales, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't had it be a problem yet. There's a place in, um, I wonder if any of you Detroit people can help me out here. There is a place in Detroit that has um, rehearsal spaces and a little performance space. I cannot think of what it's called. I think they do music residencies. They have a licensing part. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Assemble sound, does that sound familiar? 
I'm going to look it up here. I'm going to look this up because. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to put, put this in the. I worked, uh, worked with these guys a little bit, um, not worked with them, communicated with them when I was um, working at a place here in Fort Collins called the Music District, which also offers music residencies. But Assemble Sound is a really cool place because you can apply for a residency there and um, have access to their recording studio. Um, there's like kind of forced collaborations that you do with other residents but you actually have the opportunity to write some music for or and get it licensed in commercials. They have a music licensing agency there. Um, but yeah, check that out. That's a really cool resource in Detroit that I've always wanted to go visit and check out. Music residencies are another really cool thing. I think that artists take a lot of advantage of artist residencies. It's kind of one of those thing that one of those things that's like built into being an artist. You apply for artist residencies and you go and you have the time and space to do the work. There are a lot of places um, out there where you can can sign up as a musician to have a residency. A lot of them pay a stipend. They offer free housing and pay a stipend and offer play, and offer other musicians for you to um, house up with and collaborate with. Um, I would really suggest checking that out. And I'll put another. Yes, yeah, someone asks, what was the Colorado version you mentioned oh, of yeah. Great Plus that? So um, that is called um, I don't know the link off the top of my head, the music district. And this is a other great thing to check out in Fort Collins there. Um, the music district is a giant organization that's, um, run by the Bohemian foundation. So a big family foundation, and it's a campus of buildings here in Fort Collins and they have rehearsal studios. Um, they have a music residency place. They have, um, offices for music related businesses. So they have like a music lawyer, a lighting company, music journalists that have office spaces. It, it's trying to be this whole entire music ecosystem all in one place. And they, um, they have a couple really cool live programs that are on a digital platform now. One of them is called um, Shoot, I can't remember what it's called. If you get on their website, you can find out, but it's for electronic musicians. It's like a electronic musician meetup and they often have a guest, um, like a guest producer that comes on and they talk about like how they created certain beats or certain parts of their songs and they really break it down. They'll, they'll screen share Ableton or whatever program that they use to create that music um, and whatever they use to songwrite and they, they really break down their process um, I'll try to share some of these with Roger, these programs. And then another really awesome program that they usually run live, but that's now online is um, it's like a MC battle almost. And this rapper named Mers, who has Colorado ties, he hosts, and it's a op like an open mic kind of thing where the, the audience can kind of vote you in or keep or say like, keep working. Um, but MERS serves as, um, you know, like a mentor to rising MCs and rappers. And then they've been tying that a little bit in with like some of the electronic musicians and trying to, to combine forces. So check out the music district. They're doing some really, really cool and innovative stuff. And they also do a lot with songwriting as well and get some folks, some advanced songwriting instructors from Nashville and some of the places where people are just kind of like doing songwriting for a living, which tends to be Nashville and LA, it seems, um, but really cool programs. And that other link I put up there, Alliance of Artist Communities, that's like a clearinghouse for places that offer residencies. And you can see when you get on there, if it's for visual arts or music, but it's a cool way to get, get funded and have some time to songwrite or, or produce whatever it is you're producing.
What do you think, um, having moved up to Fort Collins and having played for a long time in Denver and some in Boulder, um, what do you think dynamically is different up there? You know, I, oh gosh, there's, it's so different. It's so completely different here. Um, one thing that I think is tough for musicians here is that the, there's not a lot of, because Denver is so close, a lot of, there's some proximity clauses in play, but a lot of musicians that, bigger musicians, touring bands come and they'll play Denver since it's a major market and they don't play Fort Collins. So I think that input for Fort Collins based artists is pretty limited. So they're not getting as diverse, like as diverse of musicians to listen to and to see in person as someplace like, like Denver. So artists there I think are inundated with opportunities to see their, see their peers or, or like people that are in their genre, but kind of better than them, which is great. You, you kind of want to, be around people that are better than you to be inspired and um, have a healthy sense of competition to get better. Um, I think the community here, there are, there's a lot of like acoustic music. Um, there's some like community leaders here. There's a guy, Rooster, who owns a banjo. He makes his own banjos. So he's kind of a community leader in that genre. Um, but it's not quite, I wouldn't say it's as cohesive as a music community. I, I still don't think, I think because it's a college town and there's so much, there's so many people moving in and out constantly and not, um, you know, not as many jobs, like diverse jobs as Denver, people really are coming and going a lot. And that gets in the way of like a longer, longer term um, industry growth and longer term music community growth. So it con constantly feels like it's getting like turned over and new people are moving in, new people move out, new people move in, new, new people move out. And then with that, I would say, um, as opposed to like bigger markets, I, I think, well, and I can only speak to really Denver in the, actually the Portland area too. I lived in um, Portland, Oregon area for a little bit. I, th I think like those ma more major markets um, are way more collaborative than I would than I think Fort Collins is. I think bands here, they don't share members. They think it's kind of predatory. If you were to ask like a member, like a drummer from one band to play with you, that would be like a predatory um, practice, you know? <laughs> and so I'm not used to that because, you know, I'm just used to being in a situation where everybody shares, everybody shares everybody. So those are things that are kind of surprising to me about the smaller market. But I think it is, again, coming from like a place of scarcity because there aren't all these bands and all these musicians to draw from. Like people are like, no, there's, this is all we've got. Like, this is mine. You can't stay back. Here comes poor Lolo. She'll take anyone. <laughs> She'll steal your drummer. So last week in the modules, if people got a chance to watch, there was like some heavy stuff. Like I gave a whole module lecture on just inclusive excellence versus anti-racist forms of, of, of thinking. And um, it might have seemed a little bit, you know, far away from the direct songwriting stuff that we do. But it's part of my job as a professor um, uh, for the university to address these issues. And so without putting you on the spot, uh, completely, Aaron. If you don't mm -hmm. want to talk about anything, that's fine. But I wanted to to talk about. Um, you're the first um, woman that we've had in. So Lisa G started off the class the class this semester, but um, she's not a songwriter. So I was wondered if if you had any experiences or had anything to say about gender inequity or any other forms of inequity that you've encountered over the years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that the music industry is just like built on inequity. Um, and we, we have this huge opportunity to start building roads out of that inequity. Um, I mean, I've worked in so many different uh, sectors of the music industry too. You know, I've worked in 
college radio, I've worked in public radio, I've worked in at 7S management who manages, you know, Nathaniel, Dinosaur Jr., Big Head Todd and the Monsters. I've, rare, I've worked with so few women, zero people of color in, like, uh, zero any people of color in any of those, like, I'm talking like a 15 year career span there. Um, also at the university level, um, because I went to grad school for arts management, if there was so little diversity of any kind. So like if you have all of these people making decisions based on their life experiences and their aesthetic and, and their life experiences and aesthetic are the same, like there is going to be no, there's going to be no change in the industry. So I think right now we're at a place where like people have to demand and start working actively to make those changes, like active changes. And I think that's where like I admire that Denver Arts and Venues has taken some steps to um, create like granting opportunities and um, and different kind of opportunities for organizations and individuals to to make change, I think it take, it's going to take a huge cultural shift for any any real change to happen. Mostly because people, I think it's a power issue, and the people that have the power right now are typically white men, and they're afraid to give that. They don't want to give their power up. Who would want to give up the decision making? And um, but I think it's going to take like a lot of like organizational leadership change that in combination with like a grassroots effort um, with musicians and club owners and booking agents like to kind of push push change from both both ends i don't think it can only be top down i don't think it only can only be bottom up but it has to be kind of both at the same time to to really enact change um, yeah i think what it surprises me over and over how little has changed in the industry um, you know, there were years back when um, this guy James Irvine was booking, Lair he booked Larimer Lounge, Lost Lake, some of the pl places of the size clubs that, um, that I really love playing, like those small intimate clubs. And I thought he was a great booking agent and he really, he did a great job. He's in a major market now in New York City. But I felt like he did a good job of being like, okay, well, here's poor Lolo. I'm going to put you with this artist that you don't look like, but like sonically you might vibe with. Once he left, um, like now when I have shows, I only get offered shows. It's like things have gone backwards in some ways. I'll only get offered shows with other female fronted bands, regardless of, I've been booked so poorly, like regardless of um, genre, it'll be like, oh yeah, well, there's a female fronted band like who what other band in Colorado could we have open well there's Erin she's a she's a female and it's like it's poor it's terrible booking it's it's terrible yeah I, there's I, I just I don't even know how to answer this question Roger because it's just so infuriating that so little has been done in the industry and even with audiovore you know we we were frustrated that um, when we looked out at audio engineers or or videographers that are that are making content in the Colorado area, like we couldn't really, other than the ones that we had working at um, Audiovore, it was really hard for us to figure out like, well, where are other women audio engineers, or where are the where are audio engineers of color? Like, why are why are these clubs that we're playing at, why is it just the same guy, kind of like the same guy, which there's nothing wrong with that guy, but there should be like more of a diversity in, in, who's, in who's booking and who's doing your sound and who's serving you beers. Like it doesn't have to be that same guy in all those roles all the time. So that was one of the reasons why we started that residency program is like, we need to diversify this industry profoundly like this industry needs to profoundly diversify. Like this industry is going to be profoundly more interesting and equitable if we can start providing opportunities for all kinds of people. Um, but 
yeah, there's, there's so much work to be done. Hmm. I don't even know where to be. I don't always know to, where to begin. Hmm. Other thoughts or questions from students on that or other? I mean, I think one place for people to start um, is just like, think about who you're inviting to play with you. Think about the choices that you're making at the, at your own, with, with your own band. Like, are you, are you only asking people that are exactly like you to be, be in your band? Are you like, I, I, there was one thing that we did at the music district that was so cool. It ended up, um, so we had this event where we had musicians come and then we drew names for two people to collaborate and um and then they had to like write a song by the end of they had like it was like a 48 hour film festival but they had 48 hours to write a song and we had um this hip-hop duo kind of they collaborated with a song a woman that was kind of more of a singer songwriter sarah slayton um, they'd never really met. They'd never played together before. And now they perform together regularly. They recorded a song together. Um, both, I think both of their music is better for that collaboration. And that happened in a couple of different, like draw from the hat things. So yeah, I think if you like really push yourself and collaborate with musicians, even that are genre wise, super different, some cool things can come out especially in songwriting. Where do you see the music industry in Denver going? Oh, in thank you. Of... Alex said that. Yep. Oh, man. In terms of the identity of the scene, right? Yeah. That's... Alex, I have no idea. Like, I'm really, I don't know what's going to happen after COVID. Um, I'm curious to see what survives the like economically survives as far as um, like venues. Um, I wonder, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'd be curious to hear what, what you all think. I mean, so much has happened in the trajectory from when I moved to Denver to now, even though I don't live there right now, which is also another reason why it's a little bit hard for me to answer this. Even though most of my band is based in Denver, I don't live there anymore. So I haven't been intimately involved with the scene in Denver like I used to. Um, I loved that there was a thriving DIY scene in Denver for so long that grew out these different sounds and different communities of music. Um, and and I don't know if that can ever, because of the cost of living in Denver, I don't know if there will, that thriving DIY scene can exist like it did. I feel hopeful that after this, with this kind of economic collapse because of COVID and um, really, there's a lot to write about right now, I would say. I would say like, this is a time where things like art and culture become especially important to people in community building. And I think like this is a tough time to be alive and a lot of people really are finding solace in art and music right now. So I'm curious to see what happens when we're able to get together again in person to celebrate what people have created in the midst of all like the ash of all of this destruction. But I don't know about the identity of the scene. I'd be, I'd really love to hear what you think about the identity of Denver's scene and where, what you think it is good about it and where you think it needs to grow. Would you be willing to speak on that? I know everyone has their, their, it's early, it's Monday. It's not early, it's noon, I guess, but. Is this a question for everyone? Yeah, well, I was gonna ask Alex. Alex, okay. he, he, he says, yeah, but hold up for a second, but. Okay. 
But if you have, if you want to answer in the meantime, I'd love to know what you, anybody thinks about like the, I, what, how would you classify the identity of the scene? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So my thing is like right now, I feel like all of the genres in Denver are very split up. I feel like not a lot of collaboration happens between them. Cause I feel like there's like a strong EDM scene like at, with like vinyl and stuff. And then I also feel like there's like a pretty strong like hip hop scene. And then I feel like there's a strong like underground scene, but I don't feel like people like really come together and be like, yo, like we're all in this together as like a city making music and trying to make this like an epicenter for like creative arts. Because like the, the place that I want to see it go, what I meant in terms of identity was like Nashville is like the singer songwriter kind of like country leaning place. And you have like Austin, which is just like the, yeah, like this is where you get discovered. This is where a lot of new talent comes. And you have like LA, which is just like the, the Coca-Cola of like music cities. <laughs> and I think, I think because of Denver's like location geographically and like the, the way that our population is growing, that there's like a unique opportunity to like um, create Denver as like one of those cities. And I think that it's getting there. I just think that like, people need to work together a lot more that's pretty much where i see it going if we work together and people start collaborating across genres and like really supporting each other and reaching out to each other and making an effort to like make connections then it's gonna be lit dude yeah i agree do you think alex that like people from different genres even really know each other or do you think there's so much separation like in the EDM and hip hop and kind of indie that like those they're all playing at different venues and they don't, don't even connect at all socially. I, yeah, it just doesn't happen a lot. Cause you, I mean, and like, that's understandable because you just go for like, like a lot of the reasons that like, like you'll hang out with other people who play the same music as you is because you usually just like the music that you play. So you're going to go to shows that are similar to your music and that's just, where you're gonna hang out it's more of just like it's more of just like making an effort to be like oh like i need a producer instead of like i'm gonna find a kid who's like on the same level as me doing like doing it the way that i am trying like reach out to him instead of like like paying a fuckload of money to go to a studio for someone i don't even know mm -hmm. yeah not knowing what like you're getting that type at. of stuff is like utilizing your community instead of just like throwing money at your problems yeah and I think it gets, it's challenging because when the industry gets larger, like there are more people playing music. That's why there are, there are, there are all of these different genres and there are different, like in uh, different venues where different genres kind of spread out into, but it is harder to get to know. There's like more success across the board, but harder to, um, it's harder to um, integrate those different genres once it gets to a certain size and kind of the time that that I was speaking to about like when the the scene was much smaller and there was a DIY scene there like that was something that was present was a lot more inner genre um, shows you know like a lot of those DIY shows there would be like an industrial band and a, and a songwriter or in like something I mean yeah there was just a lot more crossover so yeah yeah i just i just want to go shows meet meet more musicians <laughs> that's all i want it to be yeah i think someone else with ransom were you going to say something about what you the identity of the scene or somebody else I, it was i think it was me okay. um uh, i i think I think personally, I think Denver is one of the leading forces in the music scene. I think there is a lot of collaboration. I think there's a lot of shows and festivals. And, and I think also maybe what, maybe what Alex is talking about is more like what's happening during COVID or the fact that like, like say like 20, 10 years ago or something, people were making music, they needed more people. But now with like loop machines and equalizers or you know what I'm talking about, just things where you can make your own uh, tracks, it is easier to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Definitely.
Denver, um, Roger, you've been in Denver a long time. How would you describe the identity of the scene right now? Well, so, you know, this it, it's often about forms, forms of power and success, right? So uh, people tend to look towards the bands that are making it or major label deals. And so what we used to have back in the 90s when I started playing was called the Denver Curse. Um, it was known as the Denver Curse in the music scene, which was that every time a Denver band just got about to getting on a major label, they would break up. And it would usually be because of fighting over publishing, um, uh, because the success kind of implodes the band. Um, and then you have these bands that are from Denver that are not really in touch with the scene. And sorry, Isaac, because Isaac's my friend, but like the fray is not really part of the Denver scene too much. I mean, they've done some things where they've taken some people out at different times on onto tour with them, which is a good thing to do. But it's not like the way, like for me coming up where 16 horsepower like would take us for entire tours, like two, two months long in Europe, you know, like like where we're support for, for a, a really long thing. And they weren't even nearly as big as the fray. Um, so, there's always that kind of power thing. Um, Lumineers, for example, have done a good job at times of that, um, but I haven't always felt like they kind of came here to hang out with Paper Bird because they really liked Paper Bird and they were just here for a moment and got really big. Um, and Wes and those guys, are they're really, really nice guys and they've taken you know, other people out, but they took out someone like Nathaniel Rateliff, right? So like they take out Nathaniel and it's kind of this building momentum thing. And then, um, and then, I mean, Nathaniel Rateliff already had this kind of solo career in the wheel and born in the flood. He had done a lot of things that had kind of amalgamated until he got blown up with the night sweats. There was a real kind of base that had come through hard work on his part, hard work on people who were working for him, um, including his partner at the time. So like partners don't always get mentioned. I'm talking about, you know, like like spouses and things like this. Um, and uh, um, a lot of time those partners are essentially the business manager of the group. Yeah, that's the exactly what I'm getting at. Yep. Um, um, and so because of that so and then there's this kind of cow town identity that that denver has had for a long time um and dark country so dark the dark country thing of like munley or um 16 horsepower there was that kind of like off like because nobody really knew outside of denver for a while what denver was and that kind of blended in the mid 2000s into this broader kind of uh americana kind of thing that has stamped the identity now this doesn't mean that like we don't have a great metal scene like Cannibal Corpse or something like this is like, that's really strong. Or like what Alex was saying about the EDM scene, they're really strong, but like EDM tends to be international in scope as well. And they tend to fly people into places or fly DJs to international arenas. Um, uh, but it, there doesn't tend to be as much of a local community thing, except for the synth scene. There's a modular synth scene in Denver that's really active right now because uh, a lot of the synths are being made here. <laughs> there are com companies. So there's synth meetups. And we might have um, this guy, um, David Soto, in as a guest in future um, stuff. But like on a, you know, on a sort of national commercial scale, I mean, and maybe people could disagree with me on this, but the people who are making it big are people like Nathaniel Rateliff, Gregory Allen Isakov, Esme Patterson. What do we notice about these things? Are they bands? They're individual personas that have bands and they help things. I mean, the Lumineers is a band, but like, but you, what you see is the music industry doesn't really want to deal with bands very much because it's too complicated. They'd rather deal with one person and have that person be the manager of everybody else. And that has tended to make a focus on this kind of singer songwriter driven music where you've got the kind of acoustic guitar persona as the centralized force, 
or the center, centralized writing force, even if you have the Night Sweats, which is really an R&B band. It's a classic kind of R&B band with a bunch of people in it. That's my, that's my sense of what's going on with the Denver identity there. And I could talk about jazz or other things, but I'm, I, I, I'll keep it kind of brief. I, yeah, well, and I think you're right with like a lot of the people that you mentioned. They they I think they go by their own name also. Like they there's one songwriting person, even though the Night Sweats contribute musically the band nathaniel writes all those songs yeah um and is making the majority of the money for that band <laughs> yeah which is not to, to say that he's not equitable as a i, I think that nathaniel and i think nathaniel nathaniel is going to come into the class too but I, I i've found him to be quite equitable and these people as may patterson quite equitable about giving back to the community but in terms of this identity question that Alex has asked. I think that that's the, the aesthetic identity that's been driving Denver economically comes from that. And it, and there's like this other kind of route. You know, there's like the jam band route or the new grass kind of route, which is up in Fort Collins. And um, that translates into its own sensibility. So like we were talking about earlier working with sound engineer, engineers and like I... Um, so, and this is not a criticism of this person. I love this guy, but, um, and Aaron knows, and there's a sound engineer I know named Mario Casilio. He works now for Leftover Salmon full time. And I've made a lot of records with him, but he's a sound engineer because he works in acoustic music. He is hands off on, you have to tell Mario every single step of knobbing to, to turn. Whereas, um, Zandy Whitesell, who used to play drums for Aaron, uh, uh, and now he's Bonnie Vare's sound guy, um, and he, like, like he's always bringing stuff back in. He's like, like he's like Roger. Do you know about this new plugin called like I don't know, like the low air bass thing? And I'm like, no, Zandy, what's that? And he's like, oh, you need some low air on your recordings. I'm like, yeah. And so like, and it's like, he's willing to offer me feedback because I can, I can talk about what I want with people. And I talk very conceptually about what I want for sound people. And then they're like, oh, well, here's this thing that you might, might not have thought of. And so it, um, because to go back to Mario, because there's so much of this kind of new grass, every other brewery that you go to is like a new grass band. Like, I'm sorry, that's like, that's the people who are doing work, a lot of work, it's that kind of like mountain sound. Let's go, you know, play the, um, the mountain resorts kind of stuff. And people seem to want to hear that. Tourists want to hear that kind of thing. And so it shapes this kind of, um, mm, like a kind of aesthetic that's like, here's what I'm presenting and here's what it sounds like. Whereas, uh, and it's that like what you were talking about, Aaron, where it's like, okay, this retro or this throwback thing, you need to have the resources to do that. You need to have somebody like James Barone, or you need to have somebody like Pat Meese who have the studio capabilities and they have the sensibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I feel, and, 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 and this is why I always come back on to like why it's so important to be able to talk about aesthetics because like I love Mario Casilio so much. He's one of my favorite people, but like he's not always the person that I want to work with when I'm making a record because um, uh, I, I sometimes want more collaboration with somebody and feedback, you know? Yeah, and I like to hear... I like to hear how it's going aesthetically along the way. I don't want to record a bunch and then aesthetically tweak it to make it get there. You know, I want the aesthetics to be- a lot there. of money to do that too. Yeah. yeah. I want the song to build aesthetically from the beginning so that everybody gets the vibe and then the, the parts change because of the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. the, the parts change to fit the aesthetic. So I'm with you there. Yeah. I've also found that one of the things I've learned about myself as a songwriter is that I want, I just, I sometimes just want to write the songs. Like I don't want to be as involved in the production and the recording process. I want to like get in there and have, you know, other people do what they're really good at, which is produce, record, play the bass lines. And I want to have faith 
in you know the process and then the, and then the and the people that I'm collaborating with to like do what they do best um in knowing that like songwriting is what I do best and then I like to give up some creative control on some of the other stuff and so I can only give up the creative control if I'm totally aesthetically in line with the people that I'm playing with which has taken a long time it's taken a long time to get there and to develop that language for myself in my band and sometimes it changes sometimes I'm not aesthetically feeling the way I was you know two years ago when I recorded the last thing and I want to tweak it so yeah and that changes over time too I'm still thinking about the Denver identity thing it's like I look think about a band like Devochka who over the years has like you know they've taken other bands on tour and stuff and they've they're so big um and some of them live in denver and they're my good friends sean king is my good friend but like but because nick arada has been in la for so long now they don't feel like Devochka doesn't feel so much like a denver band to me anymore they might get mad at me for me saying that but but <laughs> sorry you guys <laughs> get back here get back to your roots but um yeah. Which one of your students is recording this to? Oh, I'm recording it, so it's going to show up on. <laughs> Play it to all. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's that ties back into the inequity questions that were coming up earlier, is because it's it's a it's a huge matrix of people sort of bubbling up to the top. There's so many different, um, um, like people working at, at different layers and those layers is it's just incremental steps at every moment of the way. Um, yeah. And that makes people um, focus. If you're thinking about an, an aesthetics of the scene right now, like it, it means that someone like Nathaniel Rateliff is that aesthetic is kind of driving things, even though I personally do not share I mean, Nathaniel's aesthetic. And, and in fact, like a lot of the things that I write are indirect aesthetic. Um, I don't want to say antagonism, but it's like the opposite. Like, I do not want to do those things. I do not want like this kind of straight kind of sound. I don't like, um, oh, so somebody else has asked a question. <laughs> um, oh, no. Oh, dissonance says Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I am about texture and dissonance, and, and there's this. It's interesting to hear Aaron talk because, like, there's this shared sensibility apparently that we have. Because I always change up my band, and I'm always just interested in letting people do whatever they want um, with me. Um, I believe, like, and and this is just me personally, but I've over the years felt more and more that it's important to have gender balance on stage either in my own group and if i can't get it in my group because somebody's not available then at least the other people that i set up shows with um so like last month i i, I was playing at uh broadway roxy and i i had met this person katie gunn who is kind of a refugee from uh from new york from from brooklyn and and i was like do you want to play like in the middle a, a set of your own in the middle of my set even though nobody knows you the booking agent doesn't know you because it just makes me feel better even playing a solo show to balance out with that particular issue um mm -hmm. it's just my that's my own little personal quest but um yeah i've felt that um just even in my own band to have gender balance has helped greatly with the vibe. I think it's one of the reasons why this latest iteration has um, hung for stuck for so long too, is that there is gender balance and makes me a lot happier at least, but everybody seems pretty content. And if for those of you who watched the Dazzle stuff in the modules last week, I mean, Ron Miles talked about um, uh, racial and ethnic balance, right? And one of the things that Ron was saying was like, uh, uh, you look for the best person for the that can do the job and like whoever that person is, um, you think about, like for him, he was saying, I think about that 
like representation and and I think about um, who is available at the time and if I cannot find somebody who's available and the best to do that sort of thing then I take the best available person to make the music realizable um, uh, and he, but he says that if you don't try if you don't try at least to have those thoughts in the selection process that's where he thinks that things go go wrong and some of you are in Ron's classes so you can maybe ask him more what he meant by that but Ron is incredible Thanks. yeah I think that you know one of the things at the the music district was they do a lot of work with bringing panels of people in and putting together groups like intentionally putting together groups of artists and they do a really good job like they wouldn't have a panel without um without at least without gender and um well they they, of, they often try to get a person of color too sometimes depending on the the topic it can be either relevant or but yeah they they try their best to do to diversify the the panel talks anytime they bring together groups of musicians um, they intentionally diversify those groups of musicians too so there's a lot of work that you can do i mean you have to have it it has to be in your mind when you're when you're building out something like that And it's not like, I don't know, like, I don't think it's also, it's not like it's just a representation game, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's not what we're talking about. Like, 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 <laughs> um, like, and I get by, like, like, I, I gotta find a Chicano friend to play with me this week. Like, it's, that's not what we're talking about. But, but, um, the reason why that kind of thinking, that kind of tokenistic thinking, I think comes up is because people haven't built relationships with other people. Um, I see this with my, especially with my Native American, I work a lot with, with American Indian movement in Colorado and that happens a lot, a lot, lot, lot to Native American people where people just assume that things work for them and they haven't built relationships with them. And you have these people who live an entirely different way of life and um, that's becoming an issue right now at Red Rocks, for example, where they're, you know, good people like Lisa G are trying to get people at Red Rocks to say like, hey, we're on Cheyenne and Arapaho territory. That's a good step to acknowledge it. But you know what? After a while for Native people, like people acknowledging that we're squatting and occupying on stolen land, like after a while, they're just like, yeah, that's nice. Can I have the fucking land back? Right, like like land back, land back. Can there be some real action and not just acknowledgement? Yeah, I think having someone admit to colonization over and over probably doesn't feel good. Yeah, <laughs> over and over. But I, I mean, I think that's the thing. Like the thing you hit on about like building community. That's where Ron. That's one of the things that makes Ron a musician like Ron so successful. Is he has built this really genuine. Um, big network of people this big community to that he works with um, because he's authentic he's trustworthy he's dedicated um and so he is when he go, when he does go to to put together a group of musicians he really can think about like how do i make the best most interesting band for in and then he he has this big group of really interesting people to draw from because of all the intense effort that he's put in over the years and I, f I feel like no matter what community, building a, a good community of musicians is like at the base level, like the, is foundational to any sort of success you're gonna have in the industry. If you don't have a good community of people, if you're not um, like an honest, hardworking, trustworthy person, like I just feel like you're gonna really struggle no matter how good your songs are. I have, more to, I, have, I have all sorts of more things to say about Ron. Like, one, like sometimes Ron gave up 
like a few years ago it just became every year like for the in the community awards for like westward awards ceremonies and stuff they just kept people kept voting him in as the number one jazz artist in denver and after a while he just told them he's like i don't want you to include me as a thing like this kind of big fish in a small pond like let, let somebody else have it like and he actually told westward not to include him <laughs> and the awards to like let some spotlight shine on to other people that's the kind of like community type of thinking that I think that he has. Yeah. Um, are there, we're, we're getting kind of close to the end, but are there other questions that people have for Aaron? I wish I could see all of you. <laughs> I imagined before this started that I would get to see everybody like videoing from their bedrooms and I can only see your library, which I was also imagining was just like a painting of a library, like a poster that there weren't any books actually there. But hi, Chris. <laughs> I could see someone. Thoughts or questions from people in the class okay. I had a question actually yeah earlier you were saying it was good to surround yourself with professionals that are you know better than you uh, I've also heard the theory and I don't believe it to be true but I've heard people say that it's uh, bad for professionals to surround themselves with people that are worse than them so do you, how do you feel about that well I would say like so I feel like I surround myself, like I, I'm confident in my songwriting. I like the songs I write, and I think that's what people are, that's what people are drawn to me in my band for, songwriting. I surround myself with people that are better at guitar than me, like Jake Miller is way better at guitar than me, but he's not better at songwriting than me. He doesn't write songs. And I play with Anna, and she's a great songwriter, and she's a, an amazing bass player. Um, and she admires, she, she gets something out of it too. So I think you can surround yourself with people that are better, that supplement what you're good at. Like you can be good at one thing. Hardly anybody is good at all the things. So I think it's just like part of a healthy band relationship. You, you figure out where your weaknesses are and what your, but also like where your strengths are, sell your strengths and then find people that also see your strengths and want to, and want to jump in. And, and bring their talent. Um, I just feel like when I l went up a level with the people that I asked to play music music with me, um, like I, the whole, everything changed for me when I had a little more confidence and was like, you know who I'd really like to play guitar? It'd be really cool if Jake would play guitar. And then um, thinking that, uh, yeah, I asked up, I married up. <laughs> musically <laughs> <laughs> nice thank you <laughs> be like yeah i think important to that tyler is like recognize where your strengths are too and like what your what you have to offer and be confident about that yeah totally thanks for coming in Thank you. Thank you all. This was fun. Yeah. I'm sweating a little bit. <laughs> we have time for like one more question if anybody has one. This is making me want to play music with you again, Roger. Yeah. The union show. Yeah. So one thing I noticed about your songwriting like over the years is and it reflects back on how you're talking about melody, how you focus on melody first, because like we take a song like Cannonball, and I don't know if I put Cannonball into the, the, the chat, but I'm just, that's the first one that's come to mind. Cannonball is the same four chords played in the same way. I can't remember all of the, the, the names of the chords right now, but um, throughout the whole song. 
but like the build of the song so the, like the melody and the phrasing switches over the same chords which is a like i see this as really a tight composing process that you do for your own stuff so like like in the song doesn't necessarily sound static when you listen to the end because it's so melodically driven that it feels like there's changes and then you know the drums come in like halfway through the second verse and i think nathaniel's playing those drums but like um and that adds the the instrumentation and the arrangement adds to it but i feel like like that's something you do like you're kind of a minimalist in terms of of um words the words are always very tightly composed they're the the the, the concepts are very tight around like the metaphor of cannonball in that song and then the music expresses its own tightness to like compositionally like the lyrics the melody and everything it, it has like this very singular thing yeah i think that that you could probably say that about most four Lola songs. I mean, most don't repeat the same four chords throughout the whole song, but that's still, that's one of my favorite songs is Cannonball. I think it's one of our most popular songs and not that much happens. You know, not, there aren't that many, um, there's no chordal changes the whole time other than those four. So, yeah. It can really throw off Sometimes I think this because the chord changes are so simple, but the the phrasing changes, it can really throw off musicians, like good musicians who are trying to learn the songs. Because a lot of time the chord changes go along with lyric with the lyrics. And so it can be like, oh, like more challenging for other people to play along with than first meets the eye when you just look at the the, the, the chords on the paper. Yeah, because for me, like like as a guitar player, it's like, oh, I can look at those chords and it's like, oh, here's the key that the song's in and here are the notes that I can like throw into like backwards guitar loops or something. But that because the, the, the song changes melodically, if you have too much of the same texture in the background, you're you, like you're doing the song a kind of mis disservice because the, the melodies should be driving the song itself. Um, and um, so you have to be sort of, you have to listen to the lyrics and the melody if you're joining somebody else's band to play guitar, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, at the same time, you know, somebody like like Gregory Isaacov once asked me to, to do some guitar work for him and, and it turned out that he just wanted me to play these notes that were already recorded on on a previous record and and i had to say like no thank you because i play guitar to be roger green i don't play guitar to be like whoever was on your <laughs> your album so i love it yeah. well they, yeah i think elliot smith did that too um you know because he recorded almost all of the i think he recorded like all of the tracks on a lot of his records and then he'd hire a band and he and he had him play it like exactly like he, he made it on the album that's a really good documentary that just came out recently there's a elliot smith documentary huh. highly recommend yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense for him because like he was really listening to the zombies and and these bands and like he knew exactly what he wanted yeah so it's 12 30 so should let you go and let everyone else go but thank you very much for being here and talking thank you class <laughs> good grades <laughs> thank you Bye. thank you um yeah i'll talk to you soon